Hello and welcome to our special solar eclipse update. We tonight are going to share some things with you. For those of you who are new to this, uh, to this audience or new to this, this group, we're going to give just a brief abridged version of our background so you kind of have an idea of where we came from. And then we're going to update all of you on what is really going on behind the scenes in the financial system and how we became part of that mission. And then we're going to talk about how we can optimize the eclipse window that's happening tomorrow. This is a huge portal and it's a very exciting time. And so we wanted to do this special update just to kind of rally everybody's energy around visioning the world that we want to create. So we're excited for the big leap. We're going to go through, you're going to hear from everybody here. You see new faces. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but let us start with the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. May light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center which the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. I'm very humbled with awe and wonder by the divine orchestration that has brought us all together, especially in this paramount time, a truly auspicious time of great transformation. I've written many pages about the future of massive change over the last 30 years, especially around alignments and gateways, as many of you know. We've already seen the expansion of consciousness exploding across social media in the last few years. My own messages started over 45 years ago when my inner ear was receiving the guidance of the Ascended Masters. They said the ascension of the planet was happening in my lifetime and that I would play an important role in it. I talked about this as a tsunami of consciousness sweeping across the planet, which just grew larger and stronger to finally tip the scale. Armed with this idea, I tried to speed up the time this would happen, and St. Germain told me, while I am a master soul, I can manifest anything I want, speeding up this time was not possible. We needed the opening of the various seals that represent a mass shift and awakening of consciousness first. This was foretold to me as the opening of the seventh seal, the crown chakra, integrating our higher selves. It was 10 years ago when on Easter, the sixth seal or third eye opened on a blood moon. This was a very moving time and was an omen related to prophetic dialogue of biblical proportions. Now we're about to witness the sun, S-U-N, on the cross in America that depicts the ascension of the whole heart. As a whole, humanity is being initiated and it started seven years ago with the other solar eclipse crossing. I knew I was on a mission from God to broadcast a frequency for transmission since my teens, such as my activation tools. I had numerous miracle-like experiences with inner and outer guidance that encouraged me to take up this narrow path. I was told by channeling from Mother Mary that I would write a great book that would imprint the consciousness grid with important wisdom for humanity, hence the seventh seal. If that encouragement didn't happen, I would never have thought to write down a thing because all my school teachers said I was a bad writer. My cosmic scientist friend, time traveler friend that I met when I was 25 always gave me special encouragement by revealing profound insights and essentially confirmations of information that I was getting the right insight and guidance. And he confirmed that I was this reincarnation of Imhotep. I innately knew much to be true, and when I had the confidence to share this with him, he said he was waiting for me to tell him that. Then he opened up and told me many more revelations. Without these and other insights, I would not have had the courage to endure such lifelong sacrifice, near-death experience, and other trials and tribulations over decades. 
Many don't know much about my walk to this point and how it's really been rather difficult and I needed the support of friends and you all to keep going, frankly. This is indeed the time of the apocalypse, which means the unveiling or revealing of full truth. It is happening in a variety of ways and in essence, I've been preparing for this moment my entire life. Now we are opening up more of the whole story to you. So let's go deeper. So, yeah. Well, you've noticed, thank you for sharing that. That was really beautiful. Um, there's a new face here. This new face is not new to our team. She's just been behind the scenes for a really long time helping us. Uh, please meet Anna Bronstein. Hi. <laughs> okay, so, you know, a lot of people might have a misconception of how many people are on the ground here and working on these things from where we are. We have an extensive team that is global, so there are people all over the world that are participating with us, but the crew here in Sedona is kind of a skeleton crew. So all each of us wear many hats, um, and Anna is no exception to that rule. She wears many, many hats um, on our team. So. And do you want to just give us like a brief background of like your, just like your professional history and how like, and what you do with us here in Sedona? Um, sure. Um, I, I've been a, a computer programmer, software developer, website designer and developer for over 40 years. Um, just did all sorts of IT technical things my entire life. and. Um, I've, uh, I've been doing uh, spiritual type of things for over 20 years. Um, Very powerful healer. <laughs> yeah. Very energy, powerful. Energy healing among many other things. And so I, I came here several years ago after watching the Deep Disclosure series um, that all of these amazing people did um, six years ago. And um, I got here and I just asked if I could help out doing office work, computer work, website work, uh, administrative stuff, um, accounting, uh, whatever is needed. So it, that, the rest is history. Yeah, she handles, all, she handles all of those things for us. So she's like our one support staff person that's here at the moment. We've had others, we've had other people uh, come and help, but um, Anna has been here now for almost five years, right? Yeah. And so she's, she's stuck with us through all of the ups and downs and the crazy twists and turns of this journey. And she's being a little humble about her, um, about her background in, in programming. Anna, how many languages do you program in? Um, I, I did not count. <laughs> I probably did 10 languages in my first year back in the 80s. And everything from the mainframe and up through all the ranks. So. And what was? How old were you when you did your first pro? Wrote your first program. Uh, my first professional program that I got paid for, I was about twelve. Yeah. And how did you transition from the you know um, tech world into the spiritual world? Or what was that like? Um, it it didn't seem like a transition. It was just um, the. I've always been interested in energy healing and psychic healing and all that stuff. I had just, I had not encountered a legitimate person who was doing that until early 2000s when um, I, I went to a workshop and I, I had a pretty clear otherworldly experience and I just jumped in both feet, took every workshop in front of me, uh, started spending a lot of time with many, many incredible, powerful healers. And I, uh, I amassed probably about eight or nine healing modalities over the following five or six years. And so it just, um, it was, an, to me, it was, it was not a, they, they, these were not polar opposites. It, it was just something, I am an evidence-based person, I, and this was evidence. I felt things, and to me, that was enough evidence. I didn't need to do more research or find more proof. Yeah, so. I, just, I love that because there's a lot of people, I think, that are in... I mean, I come from the Silicon Valley, so, like, 
there's a lot of people that don't necessarily take the leap. It's like, or they see kind of the woo-woo spiritual and, and they don't see that there's a, a huge parallel between science and spirituality and that, um, and that in, you know, going on your journey doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean that you're any less of a, you know, intelligent person. I mean, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. And um, just so everybody knows, Anna's one of our, she's family. And she is just full of integrity, full of love, and she's just one of the best people I've ever met on this planet. And we're so blessed to have her. And she's been behind the scenes for so long. You guys hear us kind of say Anna all the time, but we kind of wanted you guys to see who was here and get a, get a better picture for what was going on here. So thank you so much for sharing that, Anna. We're going to move on to a little bit of Mark's background now. So Mark, why don't you share, everybody knows Mark by now, hopefully, um, but not everybody knows exactly where Mark came from or what he does with us. So why don't you give us a little bit of insight into that, Mark? Okay, well, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Megan. Well, so my background has always been primarily, you know, for the, the sake of this work in the financial side. So uh, quite a history that took me to this point. Um, I was. We were uh, reminiscing about some some interesting times in the past when I remember when I first like had a hit, I think when I was in high school, there's some agency people that showed up and I didn't know like anything about that, but I had this impression or intuition that, that these people were like kind of interested, interested in me and that was really my first encounter. And then that would take me down a path that was very uh, bizarre and interesting at that time going forward. So. I would say after that point, I was left alone to kind of progress on my own through college. I was an athlete and that I was just mostly focusing on athletics and um, so starting to like be a kind of a leader in certain areas, setting myself because of uh, leadership positions that I had in the past and that took me into, you know, I was always a financial guy trading and doing things like that. So I guess I got noticed also that I had a knack for trading and generating money and and, in, and the knack for business deals. Yeah. So I guess uh, after that point, I kind of had this uh, shadow from intelligence agencies. I didn't understand, but my phone, as I came out of college, my phone started to you know, go off the hook and that people were interested more in uh, like giving me a job on Wall Street and then that launched my career. And I went down a path to get all my licensing and all my financial backgrounds, accreditations. Uh, my Series 7 and a bunch of other securities license. I worked for a couple of the firms on the street. Um, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, I was the head of an institutional desk. So it was like, I was kind of felt like at that point that I was being given opportunities. So it was very weird, strange hand was exposing me to so many different areas. I never liked being in corporate, in the corporate finance world. I always preferred to do private things. I was always more uh, an individual. I was kind always, of started going out on your own a little bit towards your end of that that career, right? Yeah, I, well, I left uh, Morgan Stanley and I started my own hedge fund. So private asset management. I was on top of the world at that point. Things were all. How old were you then? Uh, I was 29 when I left Wall Street and I moved back to Florida. Yeah. And I was just running my own, uh, like, uh, asset management firm, boutique, yeah. and trading, and life was good. And that, that's when life got strange, too. Can you get well, it? Yeah, what happened when 2008 hit? Yeah. yeah, not to get too personal, if you don't mind sharing, but how big was the hedge fund you, you created? It was small. I mean, it was just personal money that I had acquired and a couple of partners, a couple. I mean, uh, 20, 25 million was my total asset managed, under management. I had some, some well, <laughs> that's small on Wall Street, but, but um, yeah, and just as quickly as it came, uh, 2007 happened and 2008. 2000, well, I think it was 2007 or yeah, the crash. Yeah. And uh, kind of, it felt like an invisible hand was steering me in a direction, almost like a sabotage, and guiding me from a, like at uh, from from an like analysis standpoint, from the technicals that were telling us to do certain things that I had this you know, the the analyst on Wall Street, and that I think it was almost like a setup because the next thing I knew the market came out with the Bear Stearns collapse and then I lost all my money. Went, it was overnight, right? Well, everything collapsed. I went through like a complete turmoil part of my life. Yeah, what did that feel like? Uh, it, was, it was devastating. It was, 
Yeah. Probably the most devastating day of my life. Isn't I mean, it great how spirit just kind of relieves you of all your earthly possessions when they're sending you on your mission? Yes, that's exactly what it was. And you can't understand it at the time. You just feel like the world won't go on because everything that you know, all your success felt like it was pulled out from underneath you. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you're, you're very humble about it, but if I was 29 years old and I had gotten that much abundance under my management, I would, I would be pretty shocked to see it all go. It started a very dark path in my life where I was searching for answers and also the time when all of a sudden weird things really started to come in that I'd first seen a glimpse of. So I would say at that point, it was like almost like an invisible hand was redirecting me or trying to humble me or I didn't know, I was very confused. But I went back at it, you know, at the time, dug, dug in harder than I ever and for about seven, eight years. I was learning things that no one else was learning. I was being exposed to the biggest transaction, but no, no one in the intelligence side wanted to let me like break through in a big way. I would do very large transactions and I would try to, you know, take my fees and it was like someone was blocking the funds. Like I could not. When, what, what, at what point in that did you receive the call from basically the White House to? It was a, couple, a couple years later, which leads me into where I met Matthew. Matthew says, Probably around, I think we were saying it was around 2009. Mm -hmm. This is where, you know, I'd been uh, realizing that um, I had found out that a couple of the people that I was working with, I thought they were just business, uh, coincident uh, business uh, personnel, and I found out they were agency people. And the next thing that I knew, I was asked to be a trustee on a trust, and it's kind of a new world order trust, we should say, and. That's where I, I ran into Mathuis for the first time. He was just another name on the, on the, uh, the corporate documents at first. And there was, uh, I think there was like 14 different trustees all in different categories that had different expertise. And the rest is kind of history down that. That's when I started to wake up. There was a bigger hand yeah. that was guiding it. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that when we get into like what it is that we actually found, figured out we were doing together. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you guys just a little abridged version of my background. There's plenty of versions of this out on the internet if you want to listen to the whole thing because it's a really long story. But essentially 12 years ago or 10 years ago, I was a hairdresser working in the Bay Area and I worked on tech execu executives and I was an educator for a product line and I was, frankly, I was killing it. So <laughs> this all came as a big shock to me. So 12 years ago, uh, my father passed away and I was introduced at the time to a medium. And it was really my first experience with the divine. Um, I had believed in magic my whole life, but I had never had a real validating experience with it. It was just kind of this mystery that I was chasing and this kind of like leaky, this little drip coming down before it kind of just turned on all the way. And so the, the process of um, losing my father and meeting this medium and it activating parts of myself that I did not know I had, um, it, it changed the whole trajectory of my life. So when I met him, he told me I could do what he could do. I did not believe him. I, I, I wished like that would be awesome. But, um, he said, no, this is, this is what you're going to do in the future. And, uh, when it happens to you, you're going to think you're crazy. Um, uh, but I want you to reach out to me cause I'm gonna help you. And so about a year later, exactly what he said happened. Everything turned on full blast. I was causing power surges. I was feeling all these emotions. I could hear everybody. I could hear all the crystals. I mean, it was just wild. I went, it, it just like this magical world just collided with mine in a way that I, I couldn't go back to normal. And so around that time, after the experience of like meditating and leaving my body for the first time, I was uh, visited by some beings from the inner earth and they took me with them inside the city of Telos and they explained to me that I was about to go on the most epic journey of my life, that I was going to quit my job, leave behind all of my friends and family, which for me was a very big deal because I'm one of nine children. I'm also a uh, grew up as a twin. So going out, striking it out on my own was a huge, huge shift for me. Um, and they also informed me that during this process, I would lose all of my money, that I would be homeless, 
that I would be seen as crazy by everybody that knew me and that I, when I tried to explain to them why I was doing what I was doing, it would just make it worse and that I was gonna do all of this because I was gonna help save the world. So at the time, I thought they were absolutely insane. I didn't understand how they thought I could help save the world in any way. I was just a hairdresser. And so it was just it, mind boggling. But it just got weirder and weirder. And um, they put me through a process of remembering my past lives, um, which I don't share publicly, but there were three of them. And while I was doing my research, I found a book um, with three of my previous personalities depicted on the cover. And that was written by this gentleman sitting right next to me. And so I reached out to him and basically he had been waiting to hear from me and it was time for us to join forces and that's when I quit my life and I joined up with this wild bunch and I haven't looked back since. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a crazy 10 years. I didn't know it was gonna be 10 years when I started. I didn't really know much when I started. It was just this very compelling um, mystery and I've always been a curious cat and so I, I just had to follow, I had to follow the breadcrumbs. I had to see where, I had to see where it went. And on top of that, I, I knew that there was something that wasn't right about this world and the way things were going. And even though I didn't believe the people that were telling me that I could do something about it, I knew that I had to at least try. And so I did. And here I am. So. Well, thank you for showing up 10 years ago because <laughs> I was putting the clarion call out even then. Where is everybody that's supposed to be helping with this? Yeah. So that journey now. So Matthias and I, we 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 were the first ones to uh, to pair up. He came out to after I found him online. He came out to to meet me, um, and then we left on our journey. And for a couple of years, Spirit would just tell us, "Go get in the car, go here. Get in the car, go here today." So we'd wake up and we would just go. And every time we went, we would meet the person they intended for us to meet. And eventually they sent us down to Florida where they said we would be um, getting involved deeper in the financial system. And that is where I met Mark. Well, and the deeper is because 20 years ago I was involved in building a new financial system. I was recruited and there was you know agencies involved and all these things. And I've told this story obviously like Megan, throughout the Deep Disclosure series and other times, but it's just really amazing though that that was too far ahead of its time even then. And while we had so many things ready to launch in 2012, um, it all got shut down. The cabal reared its ugly head and trumped up charges against everybody above me, which is like four people in that group, and they all went away for like 10 years. Um, and so, yeah, it has been a very arduous journey to to follow the spiritual path, frankly. You know, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And back then I was working on those things for free, by the way. You know, nobody was writing out, like you'd like to say, checks for the revolution. We were just carrying the torch because it was burning bright in our own heart. Yeah, our compensation over these last decades, you know, combined has been just morsels of truth that we found along the way that validated that we were going in the right direction and just kind of kept us going. And so like there were always these little things that were popping up and I mean that brings me to like a little bit of story about how we kind of like really connected because now when I showed up in Florida, um, I was a California girl um, and I was born with a heavy dose of confidence. And these men didn't exactly know how to take me or why I was involved in some financial thing at all. And so, um, but I slowly won them over and it started by giving accurate information. And so the very first night that I did a reading for you, we were in the um, living room of one of your homes because you used to have many before we were relieved of all of our possessions. Um, this man, without knowing me or Matthew, took us in um, and hosted us for six months in his home. And uh, on one night, I, I 
showed him what I could do. And it turned into a very strange reading because, well, I, I'm, at the time I was really only kind of keyed into the fact that I was a medium. I didn't know um, my like interdimensional communication skills. And so I'm talking to your grandmother and your like, great aunt and they're showing me their cookies and talking about your childhood. And all of a sudden, I look over to the side of uh, the other side of the room and there's a man standing there. And now for those of you, like when I see people, it's usually like in my mind's eye, I'm not seeing them like in the room, but this was like a full apparition. Now I was the only one that could see him, but I could see him. And he spoke his name to me and I described him to Mark and I said, he, he, was, um, he was tall, very thin, kind of gaunt. Um, he had thick black wavy hair and a mustache. And he was wearing a, a suit that looked like early 1900s. It was like a wool, thick kind of baggy suit. And he spoke his name to me and it was Nicola. So I asked Mark, did you have a grandfather named Nicola? And he says, Nicola Tesla? And I look at him again, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is Tesla, I'm looking at Tesla. So he proceeds to tell us a story. And this is where things get really bizarre, right? I mean, as if it wasn't bizarre already going into this, but it got extra weird here because now there was a new element introduced into what we were all doing together that we didn't really quite understand before that. And so he proceeded to tell me that he had created a time machine and he had worked with Mark's great grandfather. Uh, they were neighbors. Mark's great grandfather was a scientist and they, and he joined Tesla in his lab. And it was around the time that Tesla had perfected time travel. And I saw them um, travel. And I saw them travel with Mark's grandfather. And so Mark's grandfather grew up and ended up being in the military and taking a very serious role there. And we'll go into a little bit more of that. But that is how we realized that what we were all doing together, it's how we began to realize that we're all doing together and what's going on on the greater scale also involves a time war that's been going on for 19 million years. And so, so that was like quite the revelation. I had no, no knowledge of your background or your family background. So what was that? Oh, absolutely. And I was in the same way. Like, that was the moment where like something switched on in me and it's like, I saw things from a different perspective because I was confused. And I know that, you know, there was an invisible hand pushing me down a path. I didn't know exactly where it was going. I'd seen my own vision, so I'd always followed. I was always a little bit of a dreamer and that I always saw glimpses of what I would be doing, but I didn't know, like there's too many un unglued parts. And that when I first met you, you were so strong in your personality and like, I didn't know how it rubbed me. I, I was thinking like, is, am I crazy? Is she crazy? Or I, I just, there was so much going, but she had so much information. I, I didn't have a, a place to put it at the time. But when she went deep into me and you did that reading that time, you not only pulled out, you also, you saw my, you described my grandfather and you, I don't know how anyone would know, you actually said his name and you, you actually got his name. And that's when like, I just went, like spirit hit me like a ton of bricks. And it connected so many things that were a mystery on my family lineage or from my grandfather and my great grandfather and that it would send me down a path to figure out the history where exactly my great grandfather, who was partners with uh, Nikola Tesla and Marconi and he actually introduced them. And then my grandfather actually was at the lab, you know, as a boy when he came from Italy and that he was then in the, in the middle of that project where his life would go in that direction and he would actually eventually be the architect and go on to what was the Area 51 library was Tonopah, Nevada. And he would eventually be the architect for the whole back end global collateral accounts where all these things that were starting to uh, awaken in us. When Megan hit on these things, it was like, who, who is this Oracle? Like what, where, how do you know these things? Like I was in awe. And that was also when you told me 
you had seen something dark in my future and you asked me, would you like me to share? And I said, please, I'm tough. Tell me whatever you see. And you said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And you said, when, you said, when you flip over in your Range Rover, just be calm. And it's going to flip three times and you're going to have a little small cut on your head, a little blood, but you're going to get out of the car and walk away. And I said, when this happens? I'm like, first of all, how does a Range Rover flip? And you said, well, it's going to happen. And I didn't want to tell you, but you asked. <laughs> so I thought like that was the craziest thing in the world. And little did I know one year later, almost to the day, because it was the same season the following year, I'm heading now into um, doing our work and we're being sabotaged. And I was called into the court. It was a very bizarre situation. I was being targeted. And I had this very weird, strange exchange with the, the judge and the judge tried to lock me up in the courtroom, literally, when I wasn't even doing, I wasn't even being rude to him. And as I left, I realized something's not right. As I pulled out of the parking lot and was driving in Palm Beach, as I was going through the intersection, someone was waiting, pulled out, put the cars in full drive, and swiped the back of my, my fender. And literally, the car is flipping over. And I, the first thing I thought is, oh my God, Megan was right. <laughs> Relax. You're going to be okay. The car flips three times, lands on its side. I'm like completely stuttered. I check myself. I have blood coming off the corner of my eye, glass all over me. And I'm like, I'm okay. I'm in shock. I'm okay. And trying to be the tough guy that I usually is like, I wanted to make sure I could get out of the car. So I pushed the glass aside and got out. And I'll never forget that. I was like, I will never second guess whatever Megan says ever again. It was surreal. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it was crazy. It was crazy. I, I remember like telling you about it. And I also knew that you were like leaving some, I knew you were leaving a meeting. And that, cause I saw you dressed in like, you know, business attire, which if anybody like <laughs> hangs out around here, Mark is like a beach bum. He loves the sun. So he will only put a suit on if it's necessary. Go into the bank. And this time I was going to the courtroom to say we're trying yeah. to like play some games with me at that time because we became um, opposition to this, uh, let's say, the, this uh, deep state or this, the old banking old guard. Yeah. Because they knew we'd play a specific role in that. And so that, isn't it true this um, grandpa and general person were first on the scene at Roswell? What happened then? Well, that's interesting, right? So these things that were now, like say deep intelligence, right? And we've heard some of the stories. I later started to put the pieces together that um, grandpa was doing this stuff at the 51 base and that's where the back end assets would be housed that were what we call the heritage fund. And I had then figured out that a lot of the people in my life were a part of like agency, CIA agency, that somehow were you know, working for another head who turns out, well, I'd be later introduced, or I was actually introduced right around this time, and he was running this operation of the whole financial system in the back, and the guys that had been around me for the last eight years were quietly working with him and uh, grooming us for the future. So it all started to connect at that point, and that's when you know I learned you know, from my grandmother's, my grandfather's full work, and then the people that he was working with, because he had passed away, and that's another story. And the next person that would come in was someone that was really close with him, and then would take me under his wing. And that was the general, that was the head. And he was at Air, uh, Roswell after the crash? First yeah. person there? Yeah, he, let's just say that general, he's no longer with us. He actually got us uh, prepared for this time, but he had the highest security clearance, off-world clearance. This is where it's like super compartmentalized, you know, Area 51 stuff. But, you know, he was, you know, traveling, you know, intergalactically. He traveled to the Galactic Federation. He had told me he'd been in 51 different unique places off of Earth, planets, different systems. It's hard to swallow at first. And he then also started to talk about something that literally is the reflection of what we would do, which is a project called Project Looking Glass. If um, we've ever dived into that, that's a topic in itself. But um, Project Looking Glass 
was something that they had seen the, the members here and others doing our work in the future. So they had a glimpse of the future and it was on a crystalline pad, kind of like a, an, I, uh, an iPad, but it was, as I was explaining to me, it was a crystal pad and they used to call it the tube. So, and the first time I had heard from grandpa, which is the general, this is the other, this is the general that took me under his wing. He was starting to reflect on things we do in the, in the future. And then I said, well, how do you know what we do in the future? And he said, let's just say we saw it on the tube, which was the looking glass, right? And they had seen us and that, that's why we had started to get tapped early on. Well, which is a segue for when I was 25. So 35 years ago in the late eighties, I was walking down the street and I got waved into a house by two people and I saw some crystals on the shelf behind them. I felt, you know, I was comfortable because when I was 21, I was getting to know crystals. I'm like, oh, they must be cool. And I went in and they're telling me about uh, trillions of dollars, trading platforms, some kind of military operation. There was um, a guy in charge and they, they gave me his initials, which turned out to be the same initials as the individual Mark was speaking about. And they were like, uh, there's going to be all this money for projects and I'm like, what are you telling me this for? You're going to be involved and you need to know. Be prepared. Yeah, it's I, there have been so many instances like that throughout our lives that are just so strange. But when we get, like, as you go on, it kind of all clicks and starts to make sense. And so, you know, they were tracking us through this looking glass. Kind of reminds me of, like, uh, that room on The Flash where he goes and sees the future mm -hmm. with the little tap. So, um, I, th I think that's a disclosure. Mm, um, so, you know, they had been watching us since before we were born. Like, they were tracking tracking us. They, they had started tracking our families. And, um, you know, the way that it kind of collided with me was, you know, my mother was, um, she was singled out and groomed by uh, a man named Anton Sander LeVay who was the head of the Satanic Church back in the 1960s. So my mother was 14 years old. And for five years, um, he was grooming her. And uh, she grew up in the projects of Oakland. And he would come pick her up in his limo and take her to those crazy parties, like the Marina Ivanovich parties. And so my mom had mentioned this to me when I was young. And I thought it was just like this one kind of crazy brief encounter. I didn't find out until much later that it had gone on for five years. So they basically were trying to insert themselves into my family to gain control of the powers that I would later develop. And so I thought when I first met these gentlemen that, and when I was working with them that like, I was a kind of a backup character, you know, that nobody was really interested in me or like knew where, where I, where I came from or what I fit in or what I, I just assumed that they thought I was one of their girlfriends and, and kind of just left me out, out of it. Um, but in uh, 2016 is when, uh, through these two, I had an opportunity to work for an intelligent, a private intelligence agency called the GIA. And, uh, during that, when they were giving me, you know, a, um, security detail and, uh, clearance they were doing a background check on me and the head of that agency came like came to me and said like I was very shocked by what I found like I thought I was gonna find some maybe like fudged taxes or some parking tickets but you have as much surveillance on you as somebody that is working directly with the president in the White House and this started in 2011 now I didn't meet these gentlemen until 2014 so this was a very big shock for me and I started to kind of like Put together the pieces where I didn't realize like I had been I had been visited in about 2010 by a, a CIA recruiter and uh, she was a client of mine I thought <laughs> and after developing a relationship with her she asked me do you know what I do Megan and I was like no I thought you were retired and she's like I'm a recruiter for the CIA and um, so I never uh, I didn't go to work for the CIA at that time um, but I just you know, I was living my life. I didn't, I didn't understand. This is all like science fiction to me. So it didn't really seem relevant to me at the time. And it wasn't until later, but in 2011, when I started causing the power surges and I, I worked in a salon, uh, with like 30 stylists on in downtown Campbell in this big Victorian. 
and uh, one day I blew out about 20 dryers in the place. The washer and dryer, I was blowing out the lights, Every and I walked in, every place I walked in on that, that little city block corner, the power would go out, things would be flying off the shelves, and, and I'm like, what is going on? I don't, I'm like, this is the most insane thing I've ever experienced. And so apparently I, I had like kind of set off some radar by, you know, this strange activity and they, I found out much later that they actually could keep tabs on people like me and that my, my relationship with these agencies and the military had begun a lot longer ago. I just had no memory of it. So... Um, which is still, I think, unsettling. And as I think any of you that have been a part of any secret government program um, kind of knows the feeling, and I don't think it's anything else. Like, I don't think anybody else can really understand it, but just just a large chunk of your life missing, missing is, is a very strange, strange experience. So, so, yeah, we had had all of these kind of strange interactions or strange interventions and all of these different agencies that... Well, yeah, and another example, right? Uh, before I was asked to be a part of this new financial system development, a few years before that, uh, and not long after I got off of this mothership, I got picked up. I've told you that story in some videos recently. I was involved in another trust dealing with... Um, a unique individual that had many many assets and he had died and I was asked to be like an executor to help wrap up things with his financial trust and I was at a meeting um, and I was introduced to a man across the table there was two sides of the table my side myself and four guys on the other side and they go well, by the way this guy's a CIA bank inspector and he's just here to observe things. And after that meeting, he approached me in the parking lot and said, here's your get out of jail free card. I'm gonna be your friend. And I'm like, oh, do I need that? And he's like, we're gonna, we're gonna be friends. And he was friends with me till not that long ago. So 20 years. And there's a lot that can be said about that. But that's even before I started to work for that financial system. So, you know, the interest of um, these stories are profound. In fact, one thing that comes to mind briefly is the people I was working for doing that, there was a time when they were like, where are you right now? I'm like, I'm in California, why? Well, there's a person impersonating you going in and out of banks in another country trying to cut these or access these accounts and do these certain things and um, we're going to fix your passport uh, you know, so that you won't have any problems. And then they contacted me a few days later, he's been apprehended, and they revealed to me much, much later, they were like, they didn't know why there was this, you know, I, I was a underling at that time in this operation, and they didn't know how come, you know, what what's the great interest, or why would somebody want to pretend you to You were impersonated nine times. Yeah, total, but, yeah. but they didn't understand, you know, uh, they didn't have the inside information that told them what we now know. Yeah. I, I would also say at the time, like, we were really confused. Like, I know I was confused, and all I knew is where my heart wanted to go as far as my, um, the vision for my future. As I started to see some of these things, I got really concerned. So I was like, this, some of this stuff was very dark. I detested being a part of a used or any type of a, uh, operation. So I ran from this stuff, right? And then, I, I realized that I became very oppositional towards a lot of the interest of some of these very hardline, you know, agency people, which this was like a part of, I guess, like almost their new world order or something. And that put me into like almost hiding for a long time that I wanted no part of it. And then I started to realize right from the general that he had groomed us to be like the white hats, like the, to basically create a new path out of this, you know, this system that has always been the same. And that was a very unique road to walk because we had a lot of sabotage, right? So, and that's what Matt, Matt Mathewis was saying is that it was a very dark time because certain people had the most power in the world of banking, the banking families, the heads of agencies, 
they weren't happy about what the things they were we were saying on the phone about how we wanted to free the world of the tyranny or we were disclosing events like 9-11 that we would found out so many things and we wanted to be so far away from that and all we wanted to do was projects and we wanted to make sure everybody shared equally like with full equity in the world system and we we knew at that point that this is not something that we wanted to be a part of so we had to like chart our own course and that's when we were like all alone and that's honestly started like a 10 year you know very very lonely very dark, and we only had each other right because we're the only ones that thought like this who shared this vision and as we connected to each other we saw like wow how divine how synchronistic you know, that we are to each other, balancing points, you know, anchors for each other's pillars to be able to play these roles for each other where there was no one else. And anyone else that was trying to circle us from intelligence, they were trying to manipulate us. They were trying to use us for whatever their agenda was and it didn't feel good. That has to be yeah. like the most unsettling part of all of this. So like, for because for me, like, like I mentioned, like I had huge chunks of my lifetime missing. And like I, like, I had no idea what my real history was or what I was really capable of and why there were so many people watching me. But when, you re when I realized the, the work that I had done, I had been taken up the first time when I was four years old. And uh, the, at that time I was taken by, you know, uh, friendlies. And they were preparing me. They had taken my sister and I uh, to see which one of us would be the one with the gift. And, and you know what, how things would go moving forward. Uh, and then later I was identified at the age of eight by some of the government programs that look for kids like me. Um, and then I was again recruited at the age of 18 when I was in college. And so none of this, I had, I had no memory of any of this. It was like that movie American Ultra uh, where he just gets activated and, and it was like, what? Uh, and so um, I had, yeah, I had no idea about any of it. And I was very blessed that a woman came into my life, um, gosh, I don't even know how many years ago now, uh, that had very deep knowledge of these programs. She showed me uh, some of the like original documents just to prove to me that it was the real thing and explain that this had happened to me and that she was gonna help me kind of disconnect uh, myself and disentangle myself from these people because I just, you know, it's just so unsettling that you have, uh, I'm a person that always has answers and if I don't have them, I can get them from, from upstairs. And so when there are things that are left blank and things that you don't know, it just feels, it feels very disempowering. And so those little things, there've been a number of revelations. I've had a number of my memories come back over the years uh, to kind of fill in the blanks. And I don't know that I'll ever know everything that happened, but like that's been part of it, like part of the, the challenge of this process. It's just like kind of being in the dark and having this entire world full of people that know everything about you, including who you've been throughout all your lifetimes. And they are, they're trying to puppeteer your life and for their own agenda. And you're just kind of like following the breadcrumbs, not knowing that that's what's going on. And so, so speaking of filling in the blanks, that's a good segue to how the things that Mark was doing, the things that I were doing, were with the same people behind the scenes. Because as we continued to add things up, the guy that was interjecting himself into my life, that was guiding me and, you know, hey, check if you're going to do a financial thing, check it out with me and I'll look into it. I'll find out if it's, you know, good people, this kind of stuff. Later... Many years later, I found out he was like a shadow head behind the director of the Alphabet Soup Group. Yeah. And that was an individual that was working with that general. Yeah, and so just to like disclose a little bit, right? So in the person that had been in Methuis's life and that had shown himself to me and, and Methuis helped me connect the dots, and then when I, I would go through my network to find out, what, this person was the shadow head for the, the agency. And he had known the advanced knowledge of what w would take us to this time and what eventually the, we would be called to ask to do. And that comes down our, you know, our background, I mean, our, our, like the training and the lineage. 
of what was there as far as the settlements, but he then put himself in a very precarious situation to kind of help us. When we had major opposition, we were sometimes too loud and we were learning things and we were learning, making mistakes, I probably, but they were, you know, but we were upsetting the heart of like, let's just say the big names that everybody knows. And I don't want to mention any of these names, but we're talking about ex-presidents. We're talking about uh, cabinet members. We're talking about heads of banking families, the usual suspects. We were really agitating them. And this is when they try to like set us up. I mean, I, I can go into stories. They try to, uh, they try to, uh, frame us and things. They wanted to get us in a very awkward situation so that we would have to do as they wanted us to do. And well, yeah, and one story that comes to mind, speaking of the protection factor, I had a, Megan and I had a Cherokee passport problem here in Arizona, and uh, basically when we went to court for the first time, there was these guys with guns in front of us, and they were basically asking where my room was, and I was shitting my pants, and then they were sitting behind us. Megan could hear them saying my name, and I ran out of the courtroom after being indicted for fraudulent charges of a fake passport that wasn't fake. I called up this guy, and I'm like, oh my God, they are there with guns, and he said, relax, that's your security detail. You, you won't see him unless there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, at the time, we were being targeted by Homeland Security, and uh, and so we got caught up in this legal issue, and it was just a nightmare. Um, we had been issued uh, passports from the Cherokee Nation, as well as other forms of identification, and uh, the home Homeland took a took issue with that. And you know, there were thirteen presidents of countries that were carrying this passport. We had friends that had traveled in and out of country on the passport, and we had no reason to believe that these were not legitimate forms of identification. And so it, like, we were, we were shocked by this whole thing. It all started with a parking violation that ended with them throwing us in the pokey. And it was not fun. And, and so, yeah, there, was, there, there were all these little things that, that happened along the way that alerted us to the fact that not everybody were fans of ours. <laughs> well, that was a hot topic, too, because these were the Cherokee passport. If you understand sovereign treaty law, the Cherokee lay claim literally from the, the Wampum Belt Treaty and a bunch of the treaties that go back that said the Indians were free and sovereign on the land. So we had immunity, full immunity passports, sovereign passports. And at the time, the Cherokees, and we were a part, and we had positions as ministers early on, they were pushing their rights and the people in the government or the agencies were trying to suppress the Indians and the indigenous and that we stood at the front of that. So it's like we like set ourselves up to be even more of a target and using whatever shields. And so that was like a super hot topic and it was something that we were supposed to come across because in the future what we would do too is to do all the sovereignty on this land, the Americas and it's another topic. But Yeah, and it's kind of, it's just like challenging, right? Because like, they, a lot of the times they, the intelligence or the military were expecting us to conduct ourselves in a certain manner. And we were not trained in the art of espionage. We are a stockbroker and a hairdresser and a couple of programmers, just a ragtag group of people that had the crazy notion that we could make things better around here. So like, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't know, like we weren't, we weren't skilled in that. And, and also when you, when you look at it, it's like, they have their hands in so much. Like, there's really no privacy on this planet at all. They can just sat, like, uh, yeah, I found that out from when they did the background check and there was a huge file on me, including videos. And I was like, I've never filmed a video. And they're like, well, they could just film you right through your wall. They don't even need that. Like, and there's been more disclosure on that now, but you know, the technologies that are on this planet that are being withheld from the people are not 10 to 50 years ahead, they're 1,000 years ahead. And so there's a lot of stuff that they have that put us at like a great disadvantage. And the only thing that we really had was, I don't know, a lot of chutzpah, you know? It well, was, no, not just that. We had your guidance from upstairs. We had my own guidance system, you know, all the information, insight and encouragement for decades, you know, before this all happened, where it was foretold, it was foreseen. It was, you know, something that... I was the crazy one looking for everybody that I was supposed to do this with decades before I met you guys. Yeah. 
And, and it never even occurred to me until I ran into you guys when I got the first confirmation that your life purpose is fit into what I thought was just like a unilateral thing. I wasn't even seeing it as, you know, so dimensional. You know, I was living more, you know, just kind of in a movie at the time and I didn't see the spiritual and then it hit me like a brick that there's these visions and the spirit came in and then I could start connecting dots that I was just like, wow, it was like epiphany after epiphany. When we were going through these activations, downloads, and it was just like so intense and it was just like, it kept the fuel for the, the, us to go forward, the guidance, the spirit, the, the revelations, to just keep moving forward because we could see the end of the book. And so as long as I could see the end of the story, I, a lot of the middle was not so clear and I was going through and learning and connecting dots step by step. Yep. Absolutely, so basically, through all these crazy experiences and just following the trail, we, you know, concluded that we were here to create a new financial system um, to help liberate humanity. And it's just, it's one of the facets of, of what we've been kind of tapped to do. Um, but it's part, it's a huge part that gets us from point A to point B. And because there's been such a, um, a lack of distribution of wealth on this planet. There's that there hasn't been money to implement the things that would greatly improve the life lives of everyone. The banks have become so corrupt that it's just impossible to move money. I just saw a, a video yesterday of a poor woman who Wells Fargo lost forty four thousand dollars of her money and said that she was a victim of spoofing and but refused to make it right. And and she's not the only one. So there's a lot of this stuff going on. You guys know that. You've experienced it. So so it, it only made sense that we needed to do this. And there's a reason why. Like it wasn't just that they saw us it's kind of it is it's kind of like one of those self-fulfilling prophecies where they saw the outcome and then they started creating it and pushing us kind of pushing us into it. Down that path, yeah. Um, but there's also, there's another reason for it. And this, I mean, this kind of comes strictly by like fate and chance. It's like a divine orchestration. So like personally, um, you know, I have like gypsy lineage. And I, you know, I'm part of the half low group X on every little uh, trajectory which they migrated on this continent and the others. And so I have DNA from almost every inhabited continent on this, on this planet. And it turns out that the financial system on this planet is a DNA blockchain. It's a human blockchain. And so when you're carrying some of these original DNA strands, uh, the, the, the system is coded to your DNA and you have the ability to unlock it. That is why we were targeted by all of the not so nice people because if they could infiltrate our us and um, get us to work with them, then they would have access to the funds, and they did that. They did that with other people. So it wasn't meant to just be the four of us. We're just the ones that are still here. And then, yes, there are other people around that are still here, but there are a number of people that did not make it because they got, um, they got infiltrated, they got um, compromised, and stuck, they- Stuck in the matrix, There's, they came yeah, out of three Or days. used to move money for the bad guys. And so, appealed by their greed or their yeah. fear or something that would keep them. Or ego. Yeah. yeah, so their motivation for, for gaining control over us was because of this DNA. And for me, it's just by chance. I didn't come from a royal family. I grew up in a trailer park. Um, I, you know, I'm a Mexican-American. My, my grandparents were um, migrant farm workers. So like, I'm not this like, it, privileged like royal individual that like would even be considered a part of any of this stuff it's just by divine design that all of my ancestors carried this these lineages um, and they rejoined here in america it's just a it's a result of the melting pot and so anyways because of this and because of our you know soul lineage which we've been able to remember this was what made us candidates for this work and, but then we had to do the work ourselves and we had to go through a number of spiritual initiations. And this is like, this is like the old mystery schools in the 3D. So it's like, it's a different kind of initiation than many of us went through in, in past lives. It's not the, you know, it's not the secret societies or like the, you know, going into the sarcophagus. It's about how do you react? How do you survive when 
it looks like you've lost everything and that you're, you know, face planting at life and and um, how do you how do you stay in faith? Kingdom, kingdom principles, faith, trust, love, and these are when you learn the truth the truth of how these things work, right? Because that's all we had. We were running yeah. on faith and we knew our hearts were in the right direction. We always knew we were here to do something or bless. And that was what was so important to us is to be able to be the change and to see people happy and to see people, you know, not suffering. And there's where the love factor would bring, you know, so it's like these things I learned in another, like how, like really like Bible scriptures and things that are coming in from like how they all connect. and which leads us also to our work with the temple and you know so many things that because it really is a com combination of all things spiritual that the creation keys of our manifestations that we are you know all of us every person on this planet shares these things and that just maybe some aren't aware or awakened to it but we don't think we're any different than anyone other just a little bit weirder a little braver to explore these things a little eclectic you know that our personalities would be such that we're like, you know, almost imaginative in ways. I'm very dreamy. And because I was always in that world, that I was able to connect between two worlds, right? And I think we all share a little bit of that, that made us a little more unique to think like, this is possible. Right? We saw glimpses of this. Yeah. So yeah, speaking of what's happening, how did these things come to be that your lineage or your involvement with uh, this master trust that we, well, that we hit that occurred. Well, I, I found out a couple things about my lineage and it was like so concealed, like we're very simple people. But as I started to look at like everything from, you know, old uh, readings of things that were, com uh, com there were confirmations that were coming through visions inside me, I was able to figure out like my bloodline and then looking at confirmations that I descended from, from Rome, right? On one side of my lineage and then to you know, the apostle lineages on, you know, which all met in Rome. And that, that would make us a little more unique from those experiences on the DNA. So the DNA, and we learned this and that we're, we're trying to teach a lot of these, these concepts. But everything that's on your bloodline or your family lineage is stored in your DNA. So when you actually bring in enough light or if you're doing your work meditating in your meditations or subjecting yourself to joy and and losing the fear, things open up and you start to recalibrate your codons and they open up just like a computer. So you'll start having visions of like what your great grandfather did or even going back 500 years on your lineage. And you think these are dreams or you think these are visions, but like they are literal truth of who you are on your blockchain. And as we went down this path and had these confirmations, we learned how to do it more often. And then, you know, these things would just keep showing up. So I can remember things that were back, like I, when I first went to Rome and I'm walking through, you know, the, the, the Acropolis or I'm walking through the Forum, you have deja vu, like flashbacks. And the first time I walked by the, the Spanish fountain the, and the Spanish steps, I'm sorry, and the Trevi fountain, I literally had a flashback to a, a, a being a, a baby in a basket. And, and then know that that was my, you know, great grandfather, you know, and that there's a storyline in his lineage back to the Vatican and that because he was a threat to the church, that they were prosecuting them. And then there's the, the lineage that goes back and that we started to uncover these things. And I want to tell everybody, the audience, this is in all of us. Like you would be so amazed if you go and do this work, you know, who you were related to, what things you can conjure up and that's what the, the teaching is, and this is what Methuselah has been showing everybody in the ascension process with the, the Seven Seal Temple. And uh, I think it's fair to say we're all, you know, uh, very unique, and we all come from the same father, mother, you know, God concept. We all have infinite uh, bloodline back to millions of years. Right, and, and fast forward into how you got into this position and this financial authority. Uh, I don't know, I think we kind of found our way in and claimed our inheritance, right? Because everybody has an inheritance and that it opened up to us and then our will and our desire and our vision to, to follow that path and our faith. But um, I would say, you know, more or less, you know, there was some work on my family's lineage and they did some things, but we were able to connect to it spiritually. So it's a lot of it spiritual, you know, uplifting and 
you know, doing the work. And I, I you know, I would urge everybody to do that because yeah. that was like the most powerful, empowering thing that you could go through, even yeah. though, through all the adversity, it was like it made it worth it. I want to touch a little bit on like what we've actually done in the kind of 3D paradigm to so far, and that will segue us into an up, our update on what's going on now. So because this is such a huge undertaking, we had to kind of like divide and conquer. And so we've all taken on different different roles within that. And so Mark's, you know, Mark's role has been to travel around the entire world and um, kind of aggregate the global assets and make relationships with all of the holders uh, to prepare them for uh, eventually um, kind of, you know, the redemption process of bringing those assets back into the system and creating actual real asset-backed money and moving away from the fiscal system that we've all found out is um, doomed to fail. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, that's what you, that's basically what you did, correct? Yeah, would, would you like me to explain a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Think, yeah he does a better Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's good to know that everybody's already confused about the financial system. So I, I call it like baking cookies. If you're going to bring new money into the system, right, this is how money's always been created through the Fed, the Treasury. There's five monetary bodies and they all share in the administration process. But behind the scene, there's like the special office of the currency control. And that pulls together the treaties and all the family bloodlines. So. The United States system is just a combination of a bunch of oil families and the old banking families and in Rome and in London and in the United States military and their intelligence getting together and saying, well, let's do the best of everything and let's make one uh, monetary currency for the world. So there's certain controls that each of the families, one family would have the gold, one family would be kept in, um, in, uh, in a possession or control of the credits that were being generated from the gold investments of the Fed and the Treasury. And then you have uh, cash pallets that are created for the future. That money can then float. And so there's all these derivatives, we call them. So there's four major you know, things. And this special office combines them. So it's like if you were baking cookies, you need the chocolate chip, the flour, the sugar. And then you could put, mix them in a pot and then you could you know, bake them. So this special office has the only oven, let's just say, or technology that would merge upon a settlement, everybody's agreement. So it's like everybody, this is all a treaty. So everybody has to agree, all the families, the keepers, the holders, and then the monetaries have to say this makes sense. And then the government in the United States and in London and the royal families that are the trustees, which are like the Windsors, and all these families basically would have to say yes, but here's the problem, right? The guys that were maintaining the asset managers, the bankers, started to create their own powerful sect and that they wanted to take all these parts from the families and they wanted to basically control with an iron hand so that you had because they were handling all these matters they started to direct the resources to them for new world order and you know so there's inherently this pull or this struggle between trying to keep the treaties fair and serve the highest purpose and it was never really i'm going to be honest it was never really uh for the people was a saying in itself. It was always about the elite people and then the elite people in a power struggle. And it was always an afterthought, the people. And this is like, this is crazy. This is our world. This is where all the children, you know, um, and the all inheritance of earth, and the meek will inherit the earth. But this system has always been unfair. And so as we started to learn, we wanted to, you know, explore how do we shift the, create a new system that is, you know, in service to all. And that's the Gaia, the Gaia Global Treasury concepts that we propose to the families and the councils to try to unite everybody in their discord and see the world's in, you know, crazy right now, wars, and they're fighting over this. This is what it is, the wars in Israel. It's all over this. And that the difference is an opinion. But we've always sought to try to unify and find a new way forward because you need everybody to agree. And that's how you create global settlement and that's how you do the redemption of the debt which is the prosperity funds. That's when the, the project money, the good stuff. So I'm happy to say we got all the agreements done and we have all the money you know, physically in the banks and we're still dealing with the last oppositionary forces of the five monetaries and these certain banking families trying to figure out how they can manipulate, which we still have a hold on and they cannot take, but how they can steer the money in the path that they want instead of us trying to steer it in the path of all. 
So this is like a four month process. We put in a lot of trillions of dollars, fully what I call the best money that's ever been created. This is cookies. This is fully gold backed USN, which is the new gold backed digital currency. And that this is the treaty's money and every person on earth is the beneficiaries of it. And that this was supposed to pay off all the debts. And some of these guys, I don't think they want the debts to be paid. They like the fact that they're indebted and that keeps them in power. So we're trying to push to clear the debt, which are the sins. These are sins right now, that's being sins. And they're trying to block us from clearing the sins and starting a fresh new system. Fully equity for the people, by the people, and that there's the last adversary, you know. But we're, the good news is the inflection of this solar eclipse is looking like a refraction point. Took the words right out yeah. of my mouth because I was going to say, now we can kind of get into how the eclipse is going to affect this outcome. But before we do that, Matthias, is there anything that you want to add about your contributions or anything that you thought no. very, I think that was not, pretty thorough. No, not coming to mind. Um, okay. Well, you know, Matthias has been in charge of the kind of technical side of it and the technical apparatus for the receiving. And so that's kind of how the workflows kind of split between the two of them. Um, we'll call that the quantum financial system, right? I'll have all these parts connect for the future and the new system, right? And Matthias has been, his background and his vision has been to always do that work. And my job is more like an ambassador or like a face to go in there and try to get everybody to agree. So I go between the world families, I go between the power mongers, I, I try to find a balancing point. Well, let's talk about the quantum financial system for just a minute. Is there really one? There's a few, and you, as you know, obviously Methuis knows, but we've been working with all the different factions of the quantum financial system, and some are corrupted, some are the same old guys pulling in their own direction, and we cannot move forward just yet until we find the balancing point between where everything is safe, uncorruptible, and everything is, you know, uh, run from programs instead of people's decision to serve themselves. So it's an autonomous system where the rules are created and the rules are right and just and fair. And this system would follow those rules rather than some human being, you know, in his own corrupt, self-serving way, trying to steer all the billions and trillions to and him. And they're targeting project. launching in April? Yeah, well, the first parts, of it, one. <laughs> the first parts of it are actually happening. And that's like, you know, some of the old um, institutions, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards are doing their version. But it's like, this is gonna take a little more time for the full, what we're the version we're looking for, obviously, is ongoing. But this is a step forward, and it makes it 80% less corrupt. You're still corruption, because it's the same old guys that are programming the computers. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. What I'd love to see right now is just getting resources to the, the white hat good good people in the world that will then create, you know, further development in the area of the just. So. And we've been trying to bring together the White Hat group. I mean, you know, when I was doing the new financial system, they were calling us the White Hats at that time. And like when I talked to David Wilcock 10 years ago and I was explaining all this to him and I'm like, we need to get all the right people together and we should be working together to get the right information out there. Um, it wasn't, I don't know, landing with him or he wasn't uh, wanting to jump in with both feet, but it's been kind of a battle of making sure that all the pieces come together in the most harmonious way. Yeah, you know, we call it like a divine chorus, right? So everybody has their own skill set. We all together, all collectively, everyone. And when we come together, we kind of make four different balancing points, we call them the pillars, but it's like the divine compliments, but now we have to go bring 144,000 you know, divine compliments together. And yeah. that's how we see it. And part of the challenge of this and what part of the role that I played here is that this is all of, uh, it's vibrational, it's energetic. And so we, you're not able, so the key, it's not physical, it's not number codes. It's an energetic key and you have to hit the right like frequency, you have to hit the right vibration in order to unlock this abundance. And so my job has to been to help kind of polish everyone and like help them work through anything that's holding back abundance or uh, not just for this the people here but everybody that's connected to us and and make sure that we're hitting we're hitting those things 
uh, as well as doing the actual like real world physical stuff that's not that exciting like all the graphic work and the cleaning and the cooking and and the supporting and like you know we do we all like I said we all wear many many hats and so but we've had to and the and the work and it's not just polishing others like it's it's about like uh, refining ourselves too I have um, I have gone through you know all of these initiations this this crazy spiritual journey in order to be qualified to participate in this and I've been so blessed to have women kind of come along in my journey and teach me wisdoms that um, were more my my you know style than um, the wonderful and amazing things that uh, Matthew has taught me and so so it's been like it's been it's been crazy. It's been this multifaceted thing that doesn't just require like it's not just coming up with the money to do these things. It's not just meeting the right people. It's about like becoming the version of yourself that's capable of doing these things. And and what I, something interesting that just I want like to share oh, before yeah. we go into the uh, the solar eclipses, we like like could never do this without each other. But I share. A special appreciation for you, Megan, and I never, it, I tell you, but I don't think everybody understands the dynamic of the, the chaos that we're, it's thrown at us in a day. And, you know, Me, uh, Megan will know that sometimes I might get 250 phone calls and they're all different parts and we don't know where to start. And it's all hitting us. And Methuis is the same. All his life work is coming. Everything's hitting us at the same time. But we sit down every couple of days and we have what we call a tune in. And this is where Megan can tap into the divine and get the, the quiet, peaceful guidance voice. And it always keeps us on the path. So she's like, she's steering us and we love you for that. And without her, we would just be like constantly fighting the 3D, you know, almost chaos on our own. And that she can tell us, okay, there's five things coming down the pipe. And she'll get a clear guidance. Drop all those, do this one thing. We do this one thing, boom, we advance into the next stage. And like without her, like I would just be confused. It's just too much, it's an overload, right? It's hard to be in spirit. And she gets that spirit like, you know, in a way all the time when, whenever she looks to it. And thank you, Megan, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's so kind of you to say, and I appreciate it. And I do feel appreciated by my, by my team. And I'm, I mean, this is my, this has become my family since I had to leave my family behind. And, mm -hmm. And I just want to point out one other thing with Anna, because she's... Well, I was just, my mind went there too. Like, how did you find us? What were you going to say? Yeah, well, before we get into her talking about that, but just to point out, like, Anna, so when we come up with crazy ideas of things that we want to do, Anna makes them work. So she, she uses her genius to figure out how do I make this, how does this work? And, and she, she creates it. So she brings our visions into the physical and yeah, so she's a fixer of sorts. She, she goes, she crosses all the different um, kind of facets of what we do and, and figures out how to make things work as well as just being this anchoring energy uh, that's just like holding it down and, and, and uh, you know, kind of keeping the, the vortex that we're creating um, in, a, in a good flow. So, uh, but, so. <laughs> if anyone's ever seen our website, the marvelous job that you've done on the website and all the she handles all the fulfillment of all the the seven seal uh yeah, merchandise dozen websites. yeah and <laughs> just all the websites that i'm saying that yeah yeah very beautiful yeah so how did you get here that's what i want how'd you find us um well i um i i listened to the the deep disclosure somebody a, a good friend of mine sent me the very first deep disclosure um, and uh, six years ago, and it, I, I resonated with all of it. That these guys, it was it was uh, Mathuis and Megan, and they were interviewed uh, by a person here in Sedona, and they went into so many. There was technology, there was cryptocurrency, there were UFOs, there were politics, there was spirituality, there were. They went into so many different rabbit holes, and every one of them I, I've i always been um, into, just all of them. And uh, Mathieu's talked about Egypt, and I uh, traveled to Egypt, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, and, and had really felt 
big deja vus there. Like I had been there 10,000 years ago. It was, it felt so familiar. And so I uh, subscribed to the channel because I'm like, I need to know when the next episode drops because I need to listen to it that day. And so after a couple of episodes, they mentioned that they kind of put in this like open invitation, you know, come join us. We're in Sedona, you know, come help us. We're just, we're bootstrapping everything. You know, nobody's high, we're not on anybody's payroll. <laughs> we're just, we're brave souls who agreed to go first and you can too. So, um, you know, nobody's recruited, nobody's, um, what else, you know, nobody's placed here, nobody's recruited. We just decided to fix this broken world. And Gra grassroots movement. Yeah. Grassroots, so. um, bare bones, you know, um, not funded. Uh, and you don't need to be, you don't need to have special licenses or qualifications or permissions. Just if, if you agree that the system is corrupt, we're here to change it. And I've, I've my entire life, since I was a toddler, I knew that the system was corrupt and never believed in any, none of the institutions that are around, I've never had much faith in any of them. Um, and so I, um, I actually, I, I uh, found Matthew's, uh, Methuselah's email and emailed him and just said, uh, basically all that stuff that, you know, I'm into tech, I'm into crypto, I'm into Egypt, I'm in, like all the things that you're talking about. Uh, I'm into spirituality and healing. And so if you, uh, if you can use my skills, let me know and I, you know, I wanna help you guys. Um, and so we talked on the phone a couple of times, we exchanged emails. He didn't like rush into, you know, giving me his website passwords because he didn't know me. <laughs> like, I, was, I, was I thought you were a squeaky wheel, and so <laughs> I, was I was a stranger. Like, okay, let's go. Yeah, I was a stranger on the phone. I didn't. I wasn't expecting him to hand off the back office keys, uh, but I just and I was living in Southern California at the time, um, and I had gone through my own crises and all sorts of journeys, and and was actually just rebuilding myself, um, and. And, but Methus just said, you know, like, well, if you're in Sedona, you know, let us know, come to our shows, whatever, uh, let's keep in touch. And so um, after every episode, I would text him and just say, hey, enjoy the episode, it's great. And then I found myself in Sedona, uh, in, I found myself in Arizona, um, a couple of hours away from here, and I texted him and just said, I'm, I'm in Arizona now. What events do you have coming up? There weren't any, um, but a short while later, I was traveling through Sedona and texted, texted him and just said, "I'm here. You know, can we meet?" And and it just kind of it took off. Yeah, I'm so it's grateful that he's so friendly and social, because you've just been an absolute gem, and I don't think that we could have done any of this without you in the end. And so. And I'm a little bit more of a hermit, and and I don't know that you would have found your way into our hearts and home if uh, if Matthew wasn't like so. He just gets a hit for it. Like I need to meet this person, and and so I'm just I'm so grateful that you joined us because it's just brought so much more joy and like kind of flow to everything and, and kind of taking away some of the chaos because it is it's so many moving parts and it's like you, know, you got all these strong personalities and and you know and and you know, we're not, it's not a small undertaking, you know, it's a big deal. And so, so I'm so grateful that you're with us. And like, you know, it's been, it's been an arduous journey, not just for us, but for everybody that has supported us. And, you know, 10 years ago, I was asked to give up everything. I gave up everything, my autonomy, my privacy, my, my comfort, my success, my family, of uh, everybody that knew me uh, for the first 30 years of my life. I, I had to walk away from all of that. Um, and some of it, you, you can't get back, you know, and I'm, I'm trying not to get emotional here, but, you know, uh, I lost my mother in the process, never saw her again. Um, it's, it's a lot, you know, and, but I don't believe that we've ever asked anybody to do anything or spirit hasn't asked anybody to do anything that we haven't been willing to do tenfold. 
And, and so I, I think that what was really important about having this kind of update was we're going into this eclipse and it's, we're less than 24 hours away. And we want to come to that with the best energy possible because it's, it's such a big deal that what, and the energy that you come in with determines how you exit that portal. And I don't want anybody that's been on this journey with us to feel like they've been struggling alone, that we have not been struggling alongside them. This has not been a glamorous endeavor. It has been really challenging. We have lost a lot. I, you know, Matthias and I spent 18 months living in a parking lot. And uh, before that, we were squatting in foreclosed homes. And, you know, uh, Mark has been to how many countries? Uh, 60 something, I, I won't know, but, and then that's all. It's not fun. It's a lot of the time, like, yeah, I'm basically, sometimes in the past, I was almost staying in hostels or the lowest budget places, or sometimes sleeping in the train station, or sometimes sleeping in the airport, oh. or just barely going with enough budget. I mean, so it's like every everything has been a challenge. It's like, how are we going to get this done with this budget? Or, you know, so we just shoot shoestring budget, I guess, to this whole process. But hey, that's part of the mission, and that's what built our character, too. So I celebrate that. And I love the journey and it wasn't easy at any part of the, the, the stretch, but looking back, I think it's a better story. It's a more rewarding and it, it, it developed us in a better way. Yeah. So. Well, that echoes some of my life too, because, you know, I mean, I almost died in the hospital 20 some years ago and I was couch surfing after that because I didn't have insurance and I couldn't work because I was paralyzed. And But always in the 11th hour, there was always some kind of, you know, divine assistance that enabled us to get to the next phase. Um, so talking about that eclipse, it is really divine in the sense that it's so synchronistically orchestrated. Think about this for a minute. So if Jesus was crucified and in the moment that he was up there on the cross, the sun blackened, do you think that was God going, oh my God, I'm so pissed off, I'm gonna turn the sun off. No, it was a synchronized moment that that eclipse that we're experiencing tomorrow was then. And so the entire divine cosmic clock and everything related to this super calendar of cycles has all been perfectly synchronized for all of these activations, all of these awakenings, all of these level ups for humanity. And this is another one that is culminating in the biggest way. We feel that it's such a trigger for the new earth and the alternate reality that we've all envisioned that we just want everybody to embrace it in the same way. Because many times in the past, we were like, what is holding this back from getting done? Like we had opportunities to have things done and they just, whether they were blocked or fell apart, the guy was on his way, got in an accident, somebody had a heart attack, all these situations largely were nothing to do with the fact that it's a divine synchronized moment for this to happen for the completion for everyone. Yep. Yeah. What, is, what is above is below. So it's like everything that's going on in the cosmos is playing out here. So it's like that's when you learn to surrender because the universe is all intelligent, all knowing, and that that's the God, you know, the spiritual side that you realize even in your worst moment, not in most worst moments, nothing's wrong and what you're going through is for your best growth. And so we always have to remind ourselves, and on the other side, we always see the sign of that, that it was that, always. That it's something is always hard in the moment, but it's so uh, valuable, rewarding, and and earth shattering as far as the revelation of going through that. And that's really why I think, you know, we can see is because we put ourselves in so many of these yeah. situations and just believed our way through it. Yeah, um, I think one of the like one of the biggest challenges during this is like having been, you know, previously viewed as a like successful person and then like and then when people see you doing the things that we're doing or taking the path that we're doing, it's not it's not viewed as respectable. It's, it's crazy. Like, you're like yeah. what? they lost their mind. Like, 
those crazies, you know, I mean, they understand, but... Even if they still love you, I mean, you can <laughs> sense the pity. <laughs> you can sense yeah. it. Um, but, yeah. but, yeah, it's like, so, with the, with the eclipse, now, I'm going to go into some of the, some of the things that I've been told by upstairs about what this is. Um, so, seven years ago, when the first eclipse happened, uh, I was told by upstairs that that began a seven year period of, you know, trials and tribulations for the rest of humanity, not the star seeds that had already gone, done their first, done the first seven years. And so, and that at the end of this would be the end of the human experiment. And that um, this would kind of like close that chapter and that would, and then it would be determined like what we, what we would do next. Now about a year after that, when asking again, um, when can we, when is this going to happen? Like, when is this job going to be done? Um, and they said to look for the big blue whale. Now, at the time, I didn't know what that meant. Um, that's often what happens. You know, you get these, like, prophecies or these riddles almost. Because it's like, a, you know, can't violate the free will. We have to be the, we have to solve the mysteries on our own. So they said, um, look for the big blue whale. And, and so I didn't know what that was until this eclipse came and it happens to be passing through, you know, the seven Ninevehs and, and Jonah and the rapture and, uh, and it also aligns with a um, constellation in the sky called Cetus, which is also called the whale, uh, which is the big blue whale in the sky. And so there was also a biblical prof prophecy of um, something Jesus said. No, I can't quote it exactly because I'm just all over the place right now. Uh, but basically... No one will get a sign other than Jonah. Yeah. And that sign would be this sign. But no one knew when he was... Yeah, like, and an comes. adulterous <laughs> and sin, like... And exactly in that... Generation. That, adul that adulterous and generous um, generation longs for a sign. But there'll be no sign given except for the sign of Jonah. And how fitting is it that we had been talking about this, trying to unsolve this one you know, a year ago, and then it just shows up, right? It's like, set us, this, that, it's just like, it just dawns on us, yeah. we're at the gate, we're at the sign, uh, the yeah. end of the age, it's really the end of the age, it's the age from Pisces into Aquarius. Yes. And we're moving in it, and we're, we're gonna, it's gonna be a rocky, because people aren't ready to understand this, so they're gonna have to go through the, their tribulations to activate, and, you know, this is the, an in, the most interesting time to be alive. Yes, and it, so it, it appears that this is the beginning of the new world. I think that there are, there's a number of things that we just don't understand because this has never been done before. Um, there, I think, will be multiple waves uh, arriving into new, the new Earth paradigm, so it's not all at once. Um, and I don't know exactly how this will look because there's been a lot of questions of like, are these people just going to be gone? Are we going to see people? But... I, I have a theory, and uh, it's been confirmed by some other like kind of quantum uh, understandings, in that basically we exist in every dimension. So like there we exist everywhere all at once because everything's happening at the same time, and the only time is now. And so I believe what will happen is that those of us that have um, successfully gained the vibration to anchor into the fifth dimension will just be met with versions of people that were already there um, and that they're third, the ones that have not decided to join at the first wave or the second wave are, they will just not experience the 3D version of them. So the version of that person that you experience will be the fifth dimensional version of them. So that'll be like all the emotional stuff will be left behind here. And so I think that's how it's gonna go. I don't know, there's not like, there's not a roadmap for this. It's never been done before. Never before has an entire planet ascended together. Um, ascension is typically a, a, an individual journey. And so, um, so this is happening. And what they're also encouraging us to do is to just detach as much as we can from the 3D. So detach from the story. Stop tuning into the news. Stop buying into it. Stop paying into it. Um, it if you get my drift. Uh, <laughs> well, there, there's obviously like this villainous story going on that these people are trying to do this, whether it's true or not. It's like, that's just the distraction. That's the illusion. And not saying that it might not be going on, you know, 
but it's just like we have to be in peace we're creating this reality and so when we settle in to our godhead and we're in you know our special place when we're not being um you know uh the the mouse on the wheel the hamster on the wheel we can then create from a, a position of our our godhead in our spirit and manifest the right way forward so kind of that's what this whole gate is about and they talk about 40 days of repentance which is the same thing as the pentecost right when remember these things are reoccurring or the same time as jonah right so this is you know the this, the calendar keeps circling and the same line uh, synchronicities keep aligning at the same time we go through these and we learn a little more every time and this is the time to cross over yeah, now because this is a strange situation and we've never done this before, that also means that during this time you'll go through um, like a living life review, uh, which is very different than, than what is typically done. Usually that happens after an incarnation. Um, so that's happening in the middle of it. So I'm encouraging everybody, if you have not done this work up to date, if you happen to catch this before the eclipse tomorrow morning, please spend tonight forgiving yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive all of it. Just let it go. You can do it. And it'll help release you from this reality. This is not what we all signed up for. We are ready to go. We're ready for something better. And in order to be at the vibration of that, we need to forgive ourselves to let go of this. And so you are loved. There is nothing but love for you. You have never been forgotten. There's... You cannot be separate from God. It is in your DNA. And this is a, an amazing time for all of us to truly feel our connection to source and to each other and to build something beautiful. And this is the beginning of the golden age. And I woke up a couple of weeks ago, just before the uh, equinox, maybe a week before that, in the middle of the night, and I saw giant gates in front of me that opened. And behind the gates was a golden city. And they said, the gates of El Dorado are now open to you. And a number of people are receiving these messages that this is happening, that this is the beginning of the golden age. And so this is, this is it for us. And this has been a long story about how we came to be a part of this, and the one takeaway that I hope everyone remembers is that there are no chosen ones, just brave souls who agreed to go first. And everybody's choosing themselves by doing this work, yeah. So everybody can create whatever they want to create or whatever's in their dream world to, to, to attach to their reality. Anybody else? Surrender. That's been the biggest piece for me. Detach, let go, allow, step back. And that's been my go-to, really. And so that I'm just in the center of my divine heart. And you know, drop out of the thinking and just allow the feeling and know that you're loved and that your own divine essence is all that's required, the purity of heart. Yep, and it's really, so we get caught in the 3D, right? So it feels so real, right? But the real us is our spirit, is our soul. So we're up on the, uh, up on the ship in the, in the 5D or higher, and that's really who we are. And that this experience is just a reflection of our, of our sometimes our lowest vantage point, our lowest views. So always remember that none of this is real, like, even though it is real to us, this is where the world we live, and it doesn't have to be, because well, we're really, one. yep, we're really, like literally existing in a, in a cosmos way above in the 5D. So if you want to have the 5D where you're in the creator mode, then you have to leave the 3D and not, you know, get caught up in it. And, you know, you see these things in the news, there's war, it's all in the 3D. We're, 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 we're the Godhead. So you can create the change just by the purity of your thought and clearing that. Aaron, anything to add? In closing, <laughs> I can't think yeah. of anything. Okay, that's okay. I just, it was funny that you mentioned the none of this is real, which is rule number one and the seven rules of engagement for winning the game of life. And I encourage everybody to keep the pocket guide with them, especially the um, warrior 
Mm -hmm. of the light, the, the warrior class, the God's, God's army. Um, they've agreed to stay behind uh, for the next two waves with humanity to help them. And so it's going to be intense energetically and emotionally. So remember the rules. Number one, none of this is real. Number two, there is no separation. Number three, you are not a victim. Number four, the universe is just saying yes to everything. Number five, everything is okay. Number six, I have no right to make demands of others and what everyone else is doing is none of my business. And number seven, all you need is love and love is all you need. And so from the members of the Seven Seal Temple, thank you so much for joining us on this journey. We wish you all a, a blessed eclipse and let's, let's do this. Let's see what we can create next. We love you all.